He is also a lecturer at the Department of Political Science here at Istanbul Sabah Din Zaim University. Uh, Mr. Fadi, the floor okay. is yours. Thank you, Dr. Miqdad. Uh, can you please close the door there because it makes noise? Uh, thank you, Dr. Miqdad. Thank you, Dr. Sami. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sami, also for putting the structure for all of this uh, program. Uh, today we will move from Pakistan to the case of Algeria. Uh, hopefully we will have more friendly discussion. <laughs> uh, so we have three distinguished scholars. Uh, we will start with uh, Dr. Yahya Zubair, uh, who will uh, talk about the role of military in Algerian demonistic and foreign policy. Uh, professor Zubair, uh, he is senior professor of international studies and he has uh, experience in many different countries and university, including uh, Europe, United States, India, Indonesia, South Korea, Middle East, North Africa. Uh, he wrote many books and articles on uh, this issue. Our uh, second speaker will be um, Dr. Rashid Telimsani, uh, who has uh, experience of teaching almost 40, four decades uh, at the political science uh, and uh, political science and uh, world politics at the University of Algeria. Uh, he received his PhD from uh, Boston University and then after that he uh, came back to Algeria and uh, was teaching in the political science. He also has uh, experience at uh, Harvard University, European University Institute uh, in Flor uh, Florence in Italy and also in Georgetown University and many other universities in Sweden also. And he will be talking about the civil military relations and the political economy of military intervention. That will be followed by uh, Dr. Tahir Kelavuz, uh, who finished his PhD in political science from University of uh, Notre Dame. He holds also master from Koch, Univers Koch University and BA from Istanbul Belgi University. Uh, he he's doing his PhD uh, postdoctor uh, in. Uh, Harvard University in America, and he will be talking about the continuity and change of the Algerian regime and civil military relations. So we will start, please, with Dr. Yahya, please, the floor is yours. We will have for every talk uh, 18 to 20 minutes, and after that we will be following uh, question and answer. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the, uh, Dr. Sami Larian for the invitation and uh, Imad Atwi for his correspondence and keeping on top of things uh, before my trip here. I surprised my uh, two colleagues this morning. I told them I am going to talk maybe a little bit more seriously because Algeria is so little known in many uh, Middle East studies. Uh, and I thought maybe it would be good to give a background, uh, a historical background on the issues and how this happened. Because I am a firm believer that if you do not understand the history of Algeria, you cannot understand what is going on today, including the recent, you know, the Iraq and so on and so forth, because of the what happened in the 1950s uh, during the revolution. Of course, the main question that relates to Algeria is who really governs in Algeria? And decidedly, it is the military. But the military has one particularity in the case of Algeria. It never likes to be seen in the forefront. Until today, when it is face to face, it's naked. The military is naked today. In other words, its power has appeared uh, in the forefront. In the past, it's always behind the scenes. And that is new. It's with the Iraq, uh, it is new. So it's the real mili uh, the holder of power. What I start with usually is the, there was a Congress during the revolution because the revolution, the uh, armed struggle against French colonialism, and that's a little reminiscent of what happened to Egypt when I was listening to uh, our, my colleagues talking about Egypt yesterday. But, but in the case of Algeria, it was sort of militias and so on and so forth, and some of the leaders of the revolution became aware that you needed to prepare for the post-war, uh, uh, you know, uh, the type of state that Algeria needed. And there were two points that were made, and this is the reference 
uh, to that Congress in 1956, and it's still, you know, uh, referred to by the nationalist, I mean, by the, uh, by the protest movement today. One of which was the primacy of civilians over military. That was a key concept at the time. The second one was the primacy of the, uh, the military, the fighters within the country against the ones who were at the borders, behind the, behind the borders that is in Morocco and Tunisia. These two are key in understanding uh, what happened. But of course, as of 1957 already, the role of the army and the security services, the so-called MALG, uh, the, uh, the ones who were in charge of getting weapons and so on, but it was the forefather of the intelligence services, up to today. Uh, they call them the MALGASH, you know? So, so they became more pronounced. Their role was more pronounced, and you know that by the 1960s, uh, the narrative, which is probably uh, uh, you know, valid today, and when I heard about Pakistan, they have the same narrative. That is, democracy won't work. Uh, one of the premises was if we had had democracy or democratic, uh, uh, democratic activities, we would not have had a revolution. We would not have had a war of liberation. So, so we would not have had the insurrection. Okay, That was uh, a very important um, uh, part of the narrative uh, of the military. So, so this, is, this is what explains the seizure of power in 1962, that is that independence. So in independence, there was this sort of uh, the bargain between the first president of Algeria and the, the military. And he was sort of the civilian at the forefront when in fact the military was working behind the scenes, especially with his minister uh, of defense. So since then, the military has played the leading political role in Algeria. So, uh, but at no time, at no time, I, I underline this point, Algerian officers assumed uh, political power as military personnel. There's not political power. Yes, there were some with you know, uh, civilian clothing or they were heads of companies and so on and so forth, you know, or corporations, national corporations, but they were presented as civilians. This is uh, quite important. So they either allied with civilians, um, uh, civilian figures, or they swapped their uniforms, uh, uh, you know, um, at the very moment they entered political office. The political history, and this is where I present my main point in the sense that if we want to understand, because if we we go through the whole itinerary of this military-civilian relations, and I know you're going to talk more into the technical aspects, if you wish. There are three centers of power in the Algerian uh, system. The presidency, the military command, and the intelligence services. And so there has always been this kind of dynamic at play between these three uh, elements. So, so the whole history of uh, post-independent Algeria is one of a balancing act of solidarity and competition among these three centers of power. So, so you'll see uh, throughout history, when I was preparing for this and looking at the entire history of Algeria, first president, second president, and so on and so forth, you see this at times, you know, the, the, balance, you know, the balance shifts in favor of one or the other. And right now, they are trying the current uh, uh, chief of staff, the head of the chiefs of staff, which, who has disappeared from the scene in the last few days, uh, but is trying to put back you know, the high command in control against the intelligence services. But they never go, you know, they, it never happened that they would go uh, full speed against one another. So I know I will be talking too much, so I have to be more selective. Um, so the from the beginning, though, this, the, the system, in my view, was doomed to fail because they, basically there was no sense of democratic legitimacy. The whole system was based on the legitimacy uh, of the war of liberation, which they had exhausted. 
personally, in my writings, I say that the legitimacy of the system, or at least uh, the, the, the re successive regimes, had basically evaporated by 1986-88. It was over. So they, they, they tried to maintain it uh, under Bouteflika, but it's only, you know, it had already uh, eroded. So, so the, 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 um, there was pluralism within this evolution of the civilian military uh, relations was tolerated within a, an undemocratic framework. You remember, uh, if you know of the work of uh, Tahir here present, uh, he talked, I mean, we were in the same line, how the regime was always able to uh, rejuvenate itself through a cool, uh, you know, toolkit, having ways of uh, solving, you know, how, how to survive. And right now they are in big crisis. They don't know how to survive, including trying to sell out, you know, the oil fields and, and other things to stay in power. In any case, if you look at the first, really, the military power as such under Boumediene through the first coup in 1965, Boumediene had one advantage over all the others. He did not have legitimacy. He was a, a very, uh, um, how should I put it, lacked charisma in the beginning, had no real legitimacy, but he was the head of the military command, and he was able to marginalize from the, the, uh, the pre uh, independence period, you know, the, um, the provisional government of the Republic of Algeria, the GPRA. So he, he was able to do that. However, he could not seize power as a military man. That's, that's, that's very important to know, because even within political uh, military circles, he was not very well known. And he came from the outside with a group uh, to which Bouteflika belonged, which is known as the Ujda uh, group at that time. So he formed an alliance with the first president only to, uh, you know, to overthrow him uh, later on, made him believe that it's the FLN, you know, the, the, the civilians who were in control. In Algeria, there was always this fallacy that it was the FLN, the, 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 the liberation, the National Liberation Front, that was basically the real decision maker. The military never showed that it was the real decision maker. It was the FLN in, in essence. That was the, in fact, you understand that when you see, whenever there is a rebellion, it's always targeted against the FLN. In 1988, it was the FLN that was targeted. And even today, it was the FLN that was targeted, not the military. The military is hawa hawa, you know, brothers and brothers, you know. Um, of course, I could, uh, in the Q&A, I can tell you about how this came about, because there is a sense uh, among the population that the military is really the guardian of the state, of the, the protector. In fact, if you look at the uh, Arab barometer, 70% uh, of the Algerians believe, uh, believe in the military. Uh, well, it's a peculiar situation because the military in Algeria is um, its a popular, it, it's, it's not, uh, it's different from Egypt. In that sense, there is a big difference with Egypt. It's, it's a people's army that everybody claims. It's the, uh, if you wish, it's the successor of the National Liberation Army. So it became the National Popular Army. But nothing changed in terms of the structure except at times, the professionalization of the military. What Boubedien did, for instance, was to uh, avoid, I mean, to professionalize the high command, did not want it to be politicized, unlike him, who was quite uh, politicized. So uh, in any case, I'm going to skip a little bit so that I can keep track of the, of, of the time. So it, the, the, the three configuration I talked about, the, uh, the power structure was maintained from 65 to 78. What did Boumedien do? And I served in the Algerian military as a conscript. Uh, the whole time, the constitution always gave a place, until then, uh, the, 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 the military was part of the construction of the country, the development of the country, and the, the military was supposed to protect the socialist development of Algeria. So there was a vision, uh, whether we agree or not, but there was a sort of vision, and the high command supported that vision, and so did the intelligence services. This is important because you'll see there will be a, a shift later on uh, under Shirley. But they supported him. 
He was charismatic. There, they, they, there was a sort of consensus. And those who were opposed to his policies eventually, under Shedley, you know, found the real, you know, the free ground to express their own opinions. And, you know, there was a quasi-liberalization, in quotation marks, of the system, mainly uh, a liberalization in the economic sector, which I call the botched uh, liberalization. But it meant, really, a more obvious redistribution of the rent to the military, to the military officers and so on, the high military officers, and with the introduction of... Uh, including uh, the, uh, the, high, uh, the, the introduction of the rank of general and so on and so forth uh, in the 80s. So um, what, okay, so what was the role of the military? The military under Boumediene and even under Shadi, you know, it was political repression. It was political repression uh, and so the system was based on violence, on political violence. They assassinated, you know, uh, 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 opponents, including opponents from the War of Liberation. They killed, you know, Krim, they killed Khidr, they killed, you know, they did that. So, uh, but he, he had a, Boumediene had a sort of socioeconomic uh, project of modernization and so on and so forth. So, we don't know. Today, the question is what would have happened if Boumediene had not died prematurely? Would, would the system have remained coherent with the vision towards the socialist direction or not? We don't know. He died and that was it. So, so it was the disappearance. This is what I'm trying to say. With his death, it was the whole system, I'm sorry, the whole project, a whole, the whole social economic project uh, that changed. He has written enough, uh, your book on the Bazaar economy, which was born basically under uh, uh, Shadli ben So, uh, uh, you know, it's, and at that, what you see, what you notice after uh, Boumediene's death, you see the reemergence of the party to play a certain role. But the reality is the intelligence services are, were the ones who had penetrated every aspect of, social, of society, including the universities. You had, and, and the nomination of, uh, of diplomats, what have you, the intelligence services had taken a, a more uh, prominent role. So, so basically, um, uh, when Shadley came to power, he too was not, very, uh, was not very charismatic, and in fact, he looked very malleable, malleable by, the, uh, you know, by the intelligence services. So yeah, five minutes, that's not a lot. So, um, all right. So, in any case, to make a story short regarding the uh, Shedley era, even under Shedley, you had this kind of reformers, if you wish. There was some sort of uh, liberal uh, thinking that was emerging. Um, and so, uh, you know, the intelligence services were used as the interface with the military command. That these were the, the, they allowed the military, the intelligence services to play a certain role until like the 80s when the, the power shift began to try to eliminate or at least to reduce the power of the intelligence services. And that was the restructuring of the intelligence services from the SM and there was this, this, uh, this restructuring and so on and so forth. So basically uh, what happened though is that, you know, now we, ca we entered under Shedley, that's my argument, we entered this uh, rent seeking and rent redistribution to the military, to the military, yet with some professionalization. There was a, a, a movement towards professionalizing uh, the army, but at the same time, there was an exclusion of the uh, opposition groups. They were either reduced, you know, or so on, and then the, 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 the uh, Regime played one force against the other. Uh, one time it was the left, but under Shedley, it was more the Islamists that they, play, uh, they played against. And you see there was a, an emergence within the system itself. This was, we have to look at what's going on within the society. You cannot just focus on the military and the civil. You have to focus on what is going on in the society, and you had different forces that emerged. Radical left, radical Islamists, Salafi Islamists, and there was no room for the moderate Islamists. They were somewhat marginalized. And there were those who wanted a sort of balance. 
In other words, uh, to, and it was under the Roi, what we called les conciliateurs, the ones who were with some sort of reconciliation to take you know, the various, um, you cannot eliminate the Islamists. You cannot eliminate the Islamist threat through security measures only. So that was the reconciliation that started with, um, uh, with Zerwal and then was taken up by uh, Bouteflika. Bouteflika agreed with that. What did Bouteflika do? I'm, I'm going to try to go faster in the sense that um, the, after you know, the, the events of 1988, the, uh, the riots of 1988, the system once again tried to find a formula, but of course they were within the military. It would be uh, a mistake to ignore the fact that within the military there was you know, a competition among different visions. Uh, some were a little bit more liberal and, and so on and so forth, uh, like others. And of course, with the rise of terrorism, with you know, uh, this all uh, changed uh, afterward. So, so in a sense, before, in the period 1989, 1991, 92, you could see there was a semblance of agreement to allow maybe some sort of transition. Uh, you know, uh, towards what? We don't know. It, I called it the perpetual transition, and it stayed until today. It's a perpetual transition. So, so but what was clear was the, change, the shift in sort of the economic orientation of the country, which became more liberal. And again, I'm talking about botched liberalism. It was not, you know, like a, a clear-cut capitalism and so on and so forth. And so under Bouteflika, it's the perversion of the regime, the, the, the true perversion. Uh, Bouteflika initially, and I know he will talk more about this, Bouteflika used the high command first, or rather, it was relying on the intelligence services, mostly on the intelligence services, until 2013, I would say, and then it was the high command again, you know, to eliminate part of the intelligence services. So he told me I have two minutes left, so I cannot uh, go for uh, too long to explain, but during the Q&A, I will have more. So, so what happened in today, the, currently, uh, the, the whole question was how to, to, limit the, to limit the power of the intelligence services. That was Bouteflika. Bouteflika was, his plan was all along, my argument, all along wanted to eliminate both the high command, to neutralize both the high command and eventually the, uh, the intelligence services. So he used one against the other, you remember the three that I was talking about, to strengthen the presidency. Of course, he had used the illiterate current uh, head of uh, chiefs of staff, you know, gave him the power. Of course, this guy has taken over the intelligence, or he thinks he has taken uh, the, the intelligence to his, uh, to his side. But then when he felt that he was going to be eliminated himself, then he turned against his former allies. And now we have a military that without a clear vision, we have a high command that doesn't know where it is going. Uh, this is, again, my, my two cents in, in all this. So, so he had this loyalty. Now there's no loyalty. And he is the all-powerful man uh, in illegitimate uh, government. And he himself is in the illegality, complete illegality, claiming that he's following the Constitution uh, when he's not. So today, the hope that we have in Algeria is, the, again, the popular, I mean, the protest movement is calling for a civilian state, the end of a military regime. That is, they say, we do not want a, a military state. So that's where we are. Um, basically, we have to take into account all of us, I'm sure the three of us here, are in agreement regarding the existence of a deep state uh, in Algeria. And so, since I was asked, give me one extra minute. Uh, I, since I was asked to talk about foreign policy, foreign policy was always almost either the prerogative of the, uh, of the presidency, but the military also had its own lines. Uh, under Boumedien, it was the third world, focused on the third world, and so on and so forth. Under Bouteflika, we had almost nothing. But at the same time, they took advantage, the regime took advantage 
of 2001, the 9-11, uh, you know, to, to build its new legitimacy internationally on the war, uh, the anti-terrorist war. And this is why up to today, uh, the, the Europeans, the Americans, and others are in a sort of bind because they don't know uh, how to act because Algeria put itself or, or became sort of pivot uh, in the region in the fight against terrorism. And they had capitalized on that. But right now, with this Iraq, you know, uh, and what is going on, it has weakened this legitimacy. Luckily for the regime right now, the people are separating separating Gaid Saleh from the, the uh, ANP and the High Command. So I don't know for how long it's going to continue, but there is a, a struggle today between trying to maintain the old system and the ones who want to do completely away with the old system. And that is what the people are calling for. This is why there is uh, guarded optimism regarding the pressure that the protest movement is putting on the system to say, you've got to go to Tnehauga. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Yahya Zubair. We will move now for the second speech, uh, Dr. Rashid Telmsani. Uh, of course, the economic uh, aspect uh, in relation to military is very important, so he will be elaborating more on this topic, please. Thank you. It would be very hard to talk after uh, my friend in speech, you know. I found very, very analytical uh, paper, and really, I like it, you know. I scheduled to, to talk on some, on five main points the national movement and the rise of the army during the revolution, that's the first. The second, the rise of the army has an hegemonic, hegemonic group at the independence. The third will be the rise of Abdelaziz Bouteflika as president and uh, the role of oil economy. The fourth will be, you know, the Hirak has a new social movement. Not only in Algeria, I would say in the whole area. I think the future will be based on this young movement. We'll see the, its main features. And the fifth point would be, I think, more theoretical. I would say we are witnessing, you know, the crisis of the security state, not the crisis of nation state, to use a securalist you know, word of umma crisis. I think we, we are witnessing, you know, the, ra, the cry, deep crisis of security state. And, and that's my, uh, my main conclusion, which, which will be very, very theoretical. To start with, with I think we have to, I have to record some facts. I have, I have to be at least in you know, a little bit a narrative because we have a lot of uh, students here, you know. Uh, the, the Algerian struggle against, you know, colonial rule started in 54. From the very beginning, you know, we have kind of confusion between the political wing and the army, the liberation movement. At the, at the first meeting of the, uh, of the liberation, we, which took place, you know, two years later in 56, as uh, Zubir mentioned, they decide in you know, one crucial idea, at, at least two, but in this regard, I have to mention j just one. The prevalence of the, of the political issue over military issues. That is, uh, the, it was a you know, very strong idea. But the rise of the, I would say, you know, the colonel you know, rule, you know, started to have, you know, to, to direct the armed struggle and the re re revolution. We have a lot you know, during, the, uh, during this war, liberation, we have you know, a lot of groupings, you know, fights and, uh, for leadership and so on. You know. But by the end of the independence, we have already a new group. We call it you know, uh, l'armée des frontières. The, it was you know, the military groups that stand on, on, on the borders in Tunisia and in, in Morocco. There were uh, well-equipped, well-trained, 
and they were not involved in the struggle. They were just sitting and having a good time. Okay, but with the independence, they make a move to take over the city. And as, as we know, in the third world, everything is our own city because we have, you know, the televisions, we have the radio, we have, we have the, 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 so, um, and it was, uh, they made, you know, the first putsch, 62. Um, they put away the, the civilian authority. We have civilian authority, you know, we call the, the provisional you know, government, which has, you know, um, uh, uh, based in abroad, you know, kind of government. Uh, and, but, you know, it was supposed to take over when the French would leave, but the military t took over. Then in 50, uh, 65, we, ha we have the second military coup. The Boumedin took over, they took the, the elected president, very well known at the time. His name is Ben Bella, very populist, blah, 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 blah. Uh, he put away. And Boumedien installed very crude and rude and harsh military bases. He started. Two years later, he, he had you know, a coup from another colonel, 67. But the coup failed. From this time, you know, I, I think the military group and their colonel, you know, who were Boumedin, get, you know, the upper hand of the rule, of, of the command. And, and he start to develop what we call, you know, the Muhabarat, intelligence service. He start, you know, um, to, uh, to take, you know, the all, all means, you know, to grow up. And he, he had, you know, uh, the, the upper hand, which is very important during this rule, you know, he had, you know, the upper hand on the, on the army, regular army, the classic army, and the Muhabarat. And uh, during this time, as uh, my friend uh, Zubin mentioned, it was very military rule, you know, dictatorship, blah, 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 no, no freedom of, of speech or speech. And, but, you know, the, the, at this time, it has, you know, what we call, you know, economic, you know, uh, positive things, you know, it built, you know, the, I uh, would uh, very strong material you know, basis. I think it, it was unique, I think, uh, in Arab state, we have, you know, uh, cases like in Egypt and Syria that have, you know, this kind of um, uh, economic base very, very strong. But the problem with this economic base, you know, it was imported machines, equipment. We don't have, you know, um, the brain, uh, the know-how uh, to, to take over. So in 1888, we have, you know, riots. We have big, 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 big riots. Meanwhile, we have new government, blah, blah, blah. We have, but the, the, the main issue, why? Because in 86, the price of oil fell down. You know, to reach, you know, at six dollars barrel. So it was kind of almost famine in, in, in Algeria. Uh, at the same time, we have, you know, within the upper, you know, elite, we have, you know, struggles. So um, we have, you know, a riots. Bon. We don't have uh, the, the problem with this uh, uh, riots. We don't have uh, really empirical data. We have only journalistic, you know, studies. But by now, I think we can say, you know, we have, you know, two groups within the army that, you know, initiated or manipulated these riots. We have, we call it reformists, one, you know, reformists, the other one, you know, have you socialist, conservative, conservative or, 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 or whatever. But the, the riots, you know, took almost across the country. But... When the right got its own, I would say, inner logic of independence, it was stopped. So the right, you know, lasted you know, five, five or six days. And then we have, you know, we lost the government, lost, you know, reform, economic reform, and we call it liberalization, <laughs> political and economic liberalization. One of the crucial issues on political sphere was, you know, democratization. We put a law on democratization. But the problem with the democratization, it was controlled by the Muhabarat. 
I think, I think all the parties, all the NGOs, uh, it was uh, the hand of Muhabarat was uh, somewhere over there. And that's the reason why myself, I don't call it, you know, revolution or, or what it's what kind of you know, manipulation. For sure, at the economic level, the situation was revolutionary. Was, uh, the, the rate of uh, unemployment was uh, very, very high. I, uh, the, the factories didn't uh, open. They were, they were closed. We have really economic crisis. But the, the, the power, he, he has said, has you know, rejuvenated itself. It has put you know, new, uh, new, new levels to govern. It was democratization. Well, all, all of a sudden, we have you know, 45 you know, parties, 60 parties, you know, 30 or 40 newspapers. Or, or, all of them were financed by, by the state, well, which was good. Let me tell you, which was good. We have kind of freedom of speech. It was really unique. Unique in the free because it was you know, power struggles. With these power struggles, every, every, every group has one or two newspaper. So we have a lot, we have, we have a lot of data information about what is going on. And so we can publish, we publish, but you know, the, the problem can be used, utilized by, by another group, but uh, that, that is a risk when uh, you publish, you know. But we have, I would say, a lot, you know, on observators abroad, say, you know, it was in Algeria, you know, the first conscient third world that we have, you know, really freedom of press. I think uh, uh, it was, uh, it was uh, uh, unique. So uh, then at the same time, uh, one uh, crucial issue on the liberalization, political liberalization, we have, you know, the Islamists. The, the government gave, you know, the, the authority of Islamists, you know, to get you know, involved with political history, although it was against the, against the law. That's another uh, uh, contradiction. The Islamists, according to the law, were not authorized to have parties. That, that, that's, that's, but uh, for power struggles, you know, they were uh, allowed to organize themselves. Of course, you know, uh, winning this crisis, meanwhile, we have, you know, um, FME, adjustment uh, structural, you know, they, uh, they closed a lot of factories. The situation was really terrible. So any party under this situation, under this condition, that, you know, make you no know, promises. You are paradise. Uh, I, I will uh, get you a job. Uh, the young you know, you are married. I, uh, you are single. I will marry you. I give you a house. I give you money, oh, and so on. So people, you know, voted for the fees. But... The, the ruling group, the military group, didn't have this kind of scenario. <laughs> that's, that's too much. The social dynamic is going very, very far. They stop it. They stop the second round of election. So we have you know, a new conflict dynamic. We call you know, um, we call you know, civil war or what, whatever. You know, Master, I, first time, I refuse the term of civil war. For me, I, I think it, it is an uh, armed conflict between two military groups. Finally, in, in uh, uh, at last, you know, 10 years or whatever, the, uh, the, the, it was, uh, socially speaking, very, very terrible, even economic, econ economically speaking. I mean, uh, the loss in Algeria lost uh, around 30 billion, economically speaking, during this period of, uh, of time. And, uh, uh, and now there is agreement, consensus that, you know, more than 2,000, uh, 200,000 people disappeared during this, you know, um, uh, uh, civil war. I, I mean, in other words, the social cost was really, really, really heavy. And until, until now, you know, uh, this issue uh, is not opened. Scholars... Uh, intellectuals don't open, but because because it is very profound in our in, in our heart, you know. I think I think it was uh, like uh, like in uh, during the armed struggle. In every family, we have you know one or two persons disappeared during this uh, uh, c c civil war. So we, uh, so we have uh, in eighty nine. Uh, eight, no, uh, 89, we have a new election, democratic elections, you know, of people at uh, the, the ruling uh, military called Bouteflika to save the country. In, in uh, 99, uh, April 99. And uh, they organized, you know, 
on uh, elections, which was, a, which was a really good for this election. For the first time, we have a you know, free election. We have you know, seven candidates, and from different political stripes. It was really fantastic, you know. It was the first time we have a really campaign, like in Western society. But in the last minute, not surprised, <laughs> six candidates withdrew from the race because they were uh, aware that there is fraud. The boot flicker find, find himself, and he was, he was elected, of course. Us. So, and he was elected first time, blah, 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 until four time. Meanwhile, meanwhile you know, what is good, he had a lot, a lot of money. Because the, the oil, you know, oh, went up until you know, over $100 a barrel. So, instead of putting this money to develop the country, they put it to buy, you know, social peace. He corrupted I would say everybody. He caught every, and he said in, in power 20 years. But on, on the eve of, of, the, of the fifth election, people said, you know, that's too much. Meanwhile, he was really, really sick. Uh, he can't move, he can't talk. Even though his terrible health, you know, uh, was ready to go for fifth, fifth term. And people said, enough, enough, enough. They went to the street. We have, we have, we have the Hirak. What is good about this uh, movement? It didn't have leadership. It is unique. I think we have uh, cross national, you know, participation. We have kids. We have old people. We have young. You have, we have, you know, uh, girls. We have. I think it is unique. One thing. The second thing, you know, people went to the street. Across the country, I think we have, a, the first, we have at one time, you know, 20 million people. In other words, 50 percent of the population were on the street. 50 percent, you know, um, up up till now, we have, you know, my protest, you know, every Tuesday and every Friday across, you know, at least, you know, 40, 48 men city. The last, uh, even sometime, we have another, uh, uh, another manifestation. Uh, yesterday, we have another manifestation about, you know, on, uh, about the, the oil law. The government passed a law to make a, a reform on, on the oil. Oil is the economy. It's the basic of the economy. And the problem with that, you know, this government is not allowed to take, you know, strategic decisions. It is illegal, and people went to the street. In, in other people are in the street not to get money, to get bread. No, for political reasons. And people are asking, you know, radical change. They want, you know, radical change, civil rule, not military. And that is, and the government and, uh, and their uh, the army direction is still playing, is still playing on this issue. And it has organized, you know, um, for the third time, you know, election on, on December 12. I don't know if uh, they will take place because people are against this election. People are not against democracy, are against election under the military. military. To, to conclude, yeah. Uh, I think the uh, very crucial issue on the, I think what uh, we are uh, witnessing, I think I, I would say, you know, deep crisis of security state. Why? Because on the eve of the independence in, in post-colonial society, we didn't build the nation. We built a strong, repressive state. I don't think, you know, in most countries, you know, we can speak of state. A state, you know, by and large, 
as we can see, has Klashikov. State, what is a state? A lot of, it is, it is Klashikov, you know. We don't have state. We don't have institutions. We don't have, and, uh, and uh, within the state, we have, we have very, what we call in Muhabarat or deep state, very, very profound. I think, the, uh, I think it is very joke to talk about civil society, political parties. I think it is joke. Over the past 30 years, what has been the, the result of democratization? The power, the military party, has, uh, uh, is getting stronger and stronger and stronger. We have a transfer from one type of, of authoritarianism to another type of authoritarianism. That is essential. We, we don't have a transition towards democracy. We have transition towards another, another type of security state. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now our third speech uh, by Dr. Tahir Kelavus uh, about the continuity and change of Algerian regime and civil military relations. Thank you. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, it's great to be here, and thanks for organizers uh, for this great conference. Um, so it's quite difficult to speak after such two uh, esteemed professors of Algerian politics. Um, they have explained things very well, and um, I'll try not to repeat, but it's, it's, also, it's also a blessing because uh, now that they explain the civil military relations well, uh, I can focus more on the regime in general and talk a bit more about the uh, recent protest, um, uh, the Hirak. So um, I'll mostly focus on uh, the Algerian regime during the 1990s and how they reconfigured the regime during that time and it ha how it affects uh, the, the, the conditions today and the protest movement today. Um, and by, by doing this, I will explain the tool set of the Algerian regime uh, to control uh, the opposition and, and, and the people um, and, and uh, how, tri how it tries to be still uh, resilient. Um, so the, as, as the professors explained, uh, 1990s was a uh, difficult process for Algeria uh, with ups and downs. And that was a potential crisis for the military. And, and, and during that time, they reconfigured and diversified their tool sets to stay in power. Um, and that worked pretty well until this point, and we'll see if it's going to work uh, as well. But the important thing about the current protest movement, the Hirak, is to understand that tool set. Because the, ar the army, the regime, is still trying to use some of the things in that tool set, so it's, it's really important to understand that in order to understand the potentials for the success of the Hirak. So um, as, as the professors explained, um, the end of uh, 1980s and beginning of 1990s was the time of the, uh, an attempt of democratization in Algeria. And that was the first of its kind in the Arab world, which was very important, uh, but it uh, ended with a coup d'etat in uh, early 1992. Um, and it was followed by uh, the so-called Black Decade, um, which uh, took place between the army and the warring factions and ended uh, with the uh, civil concord in 1999, which started the rise of, or re-rise of uh, President Bouteflika. And um, after Bouteflika came to power in 1999, um, with the deals and the amnesty coming after that, with the peace accord, um, it, to some extent, brought stability uh, to Algeria. And that stability became the key for, um, for, to some extent, the legitimacy of the Bouteflika regime as well that I'll, I'm going to explain. But the question is, in, in this process of ups and downs with first trying to democratize and then having a coup and then having uh, a, a conflict, uh, how could the regime uh, refound itself? Uh, first, we, let's zoom out from Algeria a bit and, and uh, talk about the autocrats and authoritarian regimes. So, um, in general, the main purpose of an autocrat is to survive, is to stay in power. Um, unless there are certain pressures, either from the people or from inside the regime, there are not many incentives for the autocrats to democratize. Very rarely you can see some 
quote unquote benevolent dictators who uh, initiate democratization, but it is very rare. So they want to stay in power. And in order to stay in power, uh, they use different tools, either to manipulate or control the masses and, and, and the opposition. Um, sometimes it is a single tool. And, and uh, it is usually the repression and, and the other forms of repression like coercion. And it, it is called the uh, original sin of authoritarian regimes because it is the first thing that comes into mind. Authoritarian regimes uh, rule and control with a stick. So they, they use the military force, they use the police to control the people uh, and the opposition. But at the same time, we can see some diversified tools as well. It is not only the repression, it's not only uh, bullets, it's not only the baton. Uh, you can also see some other political means to control the opposition and the masses. Sometimes um, they use institutional mechanisms, even constitutions, uh, to exclude the opposition, to divide and rule the opposition, um, to have elections but having fraud, or disenfranchise some of the people. So in a way, they give certain things to the people or the opposition, but they do it in a limited way. So on the one hand, the repression is a stick. If the repression is a stick, then these kind of tools are like carrots. So sometimes you control using a stick, but sometimes you control using a carrot. Um, and from using only sticks to turning into usage of carrots uh, increased a lot around the world, especially uh, in 1980s, 90s, and the last two decades. Um, in the past, authori authoritarian regimes were mostly what is called closed or full authoritarian regimes. Uh, they, were not, they did not necessarily have elections. Some of them had opposition parties, but most of them uh, did not have. Um, but especially in the last couple of decades, we saw that these authoritarian regimes were liberalizing. They were opening up. So they turned into some sort of hybrid regimes with elections. But these elections are not necessarily free and fair. Some of them are free, but not fair. Uh, and in this situation, um, they created some new means to control the opposition as well, the carrots that I meant. And even though at first, these kind of liberalizing means were seen as a first step for democratization, scholars and policymakers later realized that these are not necessarily a step for democratization. These are actually tools to survive. These are um, autocrats' to, uh, tools to remain in power. Um, in that sense, elections in these kind of authoritarian regimes are mostly used to control the opposition and it, at certain times co-opt the opposition. At the same time, it is to appease the people, um, just like giving them something, but not giving them everything. So this actually created a so-called trap of liberalized autocracy in the Middle East and elsewhere. And when you look at the Arab world, this actually happened as well. Um, there are two waves of liberalization in the Arab world. Uh, these are some um, figures from uh, different um, regime, in, uh, di regime indicators of the uh, Arab countries, uh, about 15, 16 countries, um, from like freedom of expression, political parties, liberties, and, and, um, and, and media. As you can see, um, obviously going up is being more democratic or more open. As you can see, the, the first peak or the first uptick is in early 1990s, and the second one is in early 2010s. So in early 1990s, not just in Algeria, in, but in other Arab countries as well, the uh, regimes learned to create some more, more openings, more space for the opposition. And they used that to remain in power, and most of them remained in power for the next 20 years. So it, to some extent it worked. And the second one was as a response to the Arab uprisings in early 2010, uh, but you can see a downturn after 2013 as well. So in this lens, if you look at the Algerian regime, um, Algerian regime was an old school, full authoritarian regime before 1990s, but they moved to this new school hybrid authoritarian regime during the 1990s. In the past, before 1990s, they depend, the regime depended on uh, three main tools, which were oil rents, legitimacy, and uh, coercive apparatus. And when I say coercive apparatus, I'm, I, I talk about the army and intel intelligence service at the same time. But during this crisis, during this reconfiguration, they 
reconfigure some of these tools and initiate some new tools as well. So the regime still has uh, the old tool, the oil rinse, uh, but they try to reconfigure the legitimacy because as, as Dr. Yahya said, the, the legitimacy of the regime, the liberator of the uh, like war of liberation started to, um, started to evaporate at the, at the end of 80s, so they tried to bring the uh, legitimacy of stability uh, with Bouteflika, which is also uh, evaporating today. Um, and they um, reconfigured uh, coercive apparatus, which I'm going to explain, and they brought some new tools as political reforms and multi-party system. So I'm not going to talk about the oil rents and legitimacy too much here, uh, but looking at the other three tools. First, the coercive apparatus. As, as the professors explained, it, the army and the intelligence service have always been very important in Algeria. They, they, they controlled, they were the main decision makers uh, with a change in balance of power, but they were the main decision makers uh, since the independence. Um, but in especially late 1980s, there was some increase in civilian role um, as well. And after the democratization process, we saw the return of the army. Um, with the coup d'etat, after the coup d'etat of 1992, um, the, the High Committee of State was founded, uh, and that was under the influence of the army, even though there were civilians in it. That, that was a de facto uh, military rule at, at, uh, uh, for, for some time. And, and during the civil conflict, we also saw a reinforcement of the Algerian army. Armed personnel uh, more than doubled during this time, and the military expenditure also doubled um, in, in, in terms of uh, ratio to the GDP. So, so the army had already been important and powerful, but it became even more powerful during that time. Uh, Dr. Rashid explained the, the army's involvement in business. It, it increased during the 90s and especially uh, in the last two decades, and also we witnessed the rise of the DRS, a, a, a reconfigured version of the intelligence service uh, becoming uh, more powerful under the, um, well, famous, infamous uh, General Taufik. So along with the army and, and the intelligence service, political reforms became a very important tool for the Algerian regime for the last two decades. Before 1990, we barely seen uh, reforms. Um, there were several instances, but it wasn't that, that common. After that, whenever the regime saw pressure from the opposition or the people, they used political reforms to, to balance things out. So the initiation of political reforms became a tactic. Um, one of the um, former members of parliament uh, from one of the um, regime parties that I interviewed once told me that um, the Algerian regime responds to the demands from the people and the opposition. And we saw this in constitutional amend amendments in 96, 2002, 2008, 2016. So this is the mindset of the regime. People ask something and we give to them. But in reality, these constitutional amendments made minor changes, they did not change the whole scene. So, so they use this saying that, oh, see, we, we, we respond to the people, but in, in reality, they don't, they don't necessarily do that. Um, we saw the same thing in 2011. Um, when the Arab uprisings reached to Algeria, uh, President Bouteflika went on TV and promised some reforms and transparency. Um, and, and, and the regime also injected some, some, some money to the system as well. Uh, but but this, this promise of reforms helped uh, the regime to, to end the protests. The, the promises were realized five years later with a constitutional amendment, which was too far from the promised reforms. So they, they, they still use this kind of things. At the end, these reforms did not bring any genuine change and the regime strategy to, to some extent worked. And then the second thing that they brought during the 1990s was the multi-party system. Because before 1989, even though there were political groups, the political parties were banned. There was no, no uh, legal political party. Um, and after the coup, rather than going back to the previous version, they kept the political parties. So at first, 
this can create more space for the opposition and they can operate and they can bring change, but at the same time, the regime defined the limits of this party system and undermined the strength of the opposition to keep them under control. Uh, so there are five features of this Algerian uh, multi-party system, which we can discuss more on Q&A, uh, that the Algerian uh, regime uses to keep them in, under control. First, they keep the parties very scattered. From the same ideological camps, there are multiple parties competing with each other and fighting with each other. Uh, and the regime sometimes uses this party against this, uh, the party from the same ideology to balance them out. Second, there are two regime parties, not just one, but two regime-affiliated parties. So if the, um, if the discontent with one of the parties increases, then the regime can um, circulate them and then bring the other party up front, and then it, it is, it's a balance in way. Uh, third, there are limitations. I mean, um, that, that's, that's a general thing. And the fourth and fifth things, that, the things that uh, Dr. Rashid explained, there is fraud. Um, it is very clear. And interestingly, there is a freedom of expression in Algeria, probably more than some other countries in the region. It is easier in Algeria to criticize the, the prime minister or, or even president, maybe not necessarily um, the military. But the regime is fine as long as the speech does not turn into action. And, and this was the case until, until the Hirak started. So the Hirak became a new form of challenge in this light. So this reconfiguration work around, worked around 20 years, uh, uh, but now, or yeah, 15, 20 years, but now there's a new challenge. Um, there's an economic crisis, there's a legitimacy crisis, and people are suffocating. So they, they needed to find new ways. But this is a new form, because these are not coming from organized politics, and the parties are not as much involved so the, the regime strategy was let them speak and we control the parties. But this is not coming from the parties. This is coming from the streets. So, so since it was a new form of challenge, the regime did not know how to respond at first. They were kind of dumbfounded. Um, and I mean, like in, in first days of Iraq, you could see some chance about changing the whole system and democratization. But the main demand was against President Bouteflika's fifth term. And maybe at that time, if they decided not to go with Bouteflika, it would be maybe easier for the regime to stop the protest, but they didn't know what to do, and they continued, and it spiraled into an anti-Bouteflika protest, and the anti-regime demand, which were already there, became the central uh, demand at that point. So in order to understand this, um, there are so many people, especially outside of Algeria, non-Algerians, um, and I'm one of them as well, but talking about Algerian people think this, Algerian people think that, and this happens too much in uh, Washington, D.C. So with two of my colleagues, we wanted to understand what Algerians think. That's why we carried out a survey um, in the last couple of months. Um, and since it is very difficult to go on the ground in Algeria right now, and to do a survey uh, and ask sensitive questions, we did an online survey, which has some downsides, but we can discuss the methodology in the uh, Q&A. And we asked several questions about their opinions about, uh, about the uh, regime and, and the protest. And in this survey, we, first, uh, we, we mainly targeted two groups. First is the protesters, and second is the military personnel. Um, and in these results, I'm going to give you the results from protesters, non-protesters, civilians, and then military personnel being soldiers, junior officers, and senior officers. When we look at the uh, goals of the protest, majority of the protesters, 90% of the protesters, obviously believe that the protest are, goals are correct and they should continue, but we see similar things even though it's a bit uh, less, we see similar things from the others as well. Even non-protesters uh, support the goals of the protest. About 70% of them support. Among the military, the soldiers and the junior officers uh, support the uh, protest more, but we see the, a decline in support from the senior officers. An interesting thing that you will see throughout the uh, graphs here, uh, usually non-protesters and the senior officers were more or less similar to each other, 
and soldiers and junior officers were closer to the, um, to the, to the protesters in their opinions. Second thing, uh, support for specific protest goals. Uh, this was, so these results are from mid-July, and we asked them uh, what, they, what is their opinion about uh, Bouteflika's resignation, and the vast majority wanted Bouteflika to leave. So, so they were on board. But when we asked about the change of system, there were some difference between these groups. Uh, so the senior officers, about half of them did not necessarily want the ch change of the system, which is understandable, but the protesters want a change of system, which means they want democracy. About 80% of the protesters want a real change of the system. And when we look at what their expectations from the protest are, about 90% believe that it's going to end in democracy. Um, again, this was in July, maybe it declined a bit, but 90% believe that it's going to end in uh, democracy, and not many people believe that civil war will be an outcome after this, um, which, is, which is important. And again, about 90% of the people, both the protesters and the others, think that a new constitution is needed in Algeria. They want a new constitution, um, and also they believe that um, the, the state should size the assets of the businessmen who are corrupt. So this is very really important when we consider the uh, business co connection and corruption as well. But what are the extent of the demands? So we asked about a potential prosecution of President Bouteflika after he resigned. People want him gone, but not necessarily prosecuted. About 40% wants him prosecuted, but not all of it. So probably, I mean, at, at least in our survey, that is the result. One interesting finding for us was the remo removal of Chief of Staff Gait Salah, which was a bit lower than we expected, but again, this is from July. Maybe it increased a bit. About only 30% of the protesters want him gone, uh, which was, I was expecting more. Um, but in another question that we asked, actually more people are fine with him removed by the military, so they are fine with him replaced by another military officer. So finally about civil military relations. The people in Algeria, as the professor said, people respect the Algerian army, but there are limitations for that. They don't necessarily want the Algerian army to referee the political arena. When we look at that, about 30% is fine with Algerian army playing politics, uh, but 70% don't want this. This is a big number. Uh, obviously, the military wants it more, uh, but, but the civilians don't necessarily want that. Um, and um, also, if you see that, people are fine with Algerian military having a say on security issues. So it's the, the problem is not with the Algerian military, the problem is with the involvement of the military with the politics. And, um, okay, I'm gonna conclude. Um, so, in short, the Algerian system, Algerian, Algerian regime reconfigured itself uh, in 1990s and brought some new tools, but some of these tools were not working and this started Hirak. And during Hirak, the regime is still trying to use some of these. At the same time, they use some sort of repression. They are arresting some of the opposition politicians uh, and protesters in the last, last couple of weeks and months. But at the, at, the, at the same time, they are using some of the reforms. They are trying to prosecute some of the corrupt politicians and businessmen, and they are trying to promise some reforms, but so far, none of these worked. Why? Because the reforms that the regime promised so far are mostly short-term, Band-Aid-like solutions. They did not necessarily promise uh, democratization. There is no long-term response coming from the regime. Uh, that is why people are not accepting an election uh, that is bringing a real democratization so far. But is that enough to convince the protesters? It's, it's difficult to know. And actually, that, that, that probably uh, defines the fate of the Hirak as well. Um, I mean, the, 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 the continuation of the protest uh, is, is crucial for the success of Iraq, but at the same time, we have a regime that is not necessarily responding to the demands. So this is right now a chess game. On the one side, we have protesters pushing for change, but on the other hand, we have the regime and mainly the military 
trying to keep their uh, authority. And which one is going to give up first? It is still unknown, but it is, it is going to be the key. And most probably, while people are still doing this and still striving, probably the opposition should unite and try to do something at the same time because the regime is using the opposition to end the whole process as well. So we are going to see the outcome and we can discuss more on the Q&A. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Tahir Kelavos. Uh, now we will move to questions. Uh, we have like 30 minutes uh, for the questions. I will start uh, asking um, each speaker one question. You mentioned that uh, <clears throat> we have in Algeria, like Pakistan, uh, the narrative that democracy will not work in this country and uh, the military trying to, to have this discourse always that democracy uh, is not working in Algeria, it's like Pakistan. So how do you think uh, we can counter this? Uh, to Dr. Rashid Tilmsani, you mentioned that military is getting stronger every day. Uh, so uh, what, is, what are the practical steps that we can take on the ground practically to restrain uh, this military getting strong and strong? Lastly, to Dr. Tahir, you mentioned about the authoritarian system, how they uh, theoretically works, how they try to uh, uh, destroy the opposite uh, opposition, etc. So uh, how they use, for example, uh, this idea of stability to control as an excuse. So uh, how do you think we can counter this uh, narrative that uh, from uh, civil society perspective at least? Thank you. Now we will move to questions. Okay. Okay. We will start with Imad because, yeah. <laughs> yes. Thank you for giving me space. Um, um, thank you for your uh, provocative um, presentations. Many questions lined as in my mind, but again, I will. Um, I have. I will uh, sit myself for one one in my comment, then I, on which I build my uh, my question. Um, if the notion of the civil military relation is about drawing borders between civilians and people with arms, the concept, however, that differs from the Western to the MENA cases. Here I refer to Egypt and Algeria specifically. The Western case to the civil military concepts, approaches and theories try to enable the military to get small space in decision making when it comes to the national defense. But in the case of the military, of the military systems in our region, in Africa, scholars still research how to find and enable the civilian to get a place in the political military camp, especially in Algeria and Egypt. We could somehow answer a question of why states in the region are military and why the military states still in existence, the cultural many factors you most for even uh, from yesterday. But we stuck in answering the question of how we enable the civilian to have his place in politics. My question, coming back again to the question of how we do enable the civilians to take part in the state, which is the first state, Many speakers mention different, different solutions, but again, are normative. For instance, sending military to retirement, okay. who send who. Um, also, civil society, with its peaceful and strong movement in Algeria, could somehow shake the regime, but could not change it. Okay. Don't you think that it is necessary, even crucial, to have another power from the lamp of the military institution itself, that is the main actor holding the power? This power must have ability to change and work on shifting the power from the military to civilians, like many cases in Europe, which is the case with the common factor in the, in the different places in the, in the Eastern Senor. And here I could theoretically refer to Montesquieu, a quotation where he said, pour qu'on puisse abuser du pouvoir, il faut que par la disposition des choses de pouvoir arrête le pouvoir. Means we need power that we count on to stop another power. Okay. Um, for the last comment for, uh, for Dr. Tahir, the card and stick Talking that proves and hypothesizes finally that military system coexists with the given environment. The Turkey, that you mentioned, is among many targets we have seen since 1962. And thank you. Okay, so yes, here, please. Please uh, introduce yourself. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Kiman. Um, my name is Mohammed Arun. I'm from uh, the University of Khartoum, Sudan. Um, and now, with, uh, with um, uh, the presentations we had on the cases of uh, civilian military in 
in um, um, in cases like Egypt, Pakistan, and Algeria. Um, um, it looks like there are there are things in common. Um, one thing in common is uh, that uh, uh, it looks like the military is uh, is not just um, um, right as a center of the establishment. It's rather the establishment itself is so deep seated in, in, in these three cases. Maybe Turkey is also a case which uh, we have not uh, yet had, uh, had any presentation on. Uh, so, uh, in case that is the case, um, and together with, uh, with taking into account that there, uh, there are cases which are country specific. So, um, um, uh, given this, it looks like it's rather difficult to go for a kind of a global um, uh, model of democracy. Um, in, in the cases that we have been uh, um, um, uh, and we have just gone through, it looks like there is some kind of, of, of a marriage between the military and power, okay. which might uh, not uh, um, uh, uh, match with, with the popular uh, multi-party model, Western, Western okay. style multi-party model. Okay. So is there any way uh, that we, uh, we uh, um, we consider thinking about uh, what uh, Dr. Bruce called yesterday a grand bargain and it's a shadil between the civilian and, mili and the military tours, seeing some kind of um, democratic transformation okay. in, uh, in, in, in the region at least. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, please try to keep your question or comment within like 30 seconds or one minute so we can get more questions. Yes, please. Thank you very much for the panelists. I have three questions. One, uh, the first one for uh, Dr. Yahya, is uh, about the uh, memory, memory of the uh, black decade. Uh, do you think that uh, this uh, memory, this experience has uh, an, an impact on the, uh, the, the solution of this uh, conflict between Iraq and, uh, and the military establishment in Algeria? Do you think that maybe this uh, memory restrain and break the, the violence of the military. And I have a question for uh, uh, Dr. Rashid. It's about the, it's about the, there is a link, I think, in our history between the economic crisis and the change. Every time that we had a crisis, for example, you know, you mentioned the economic crisis during the 80, and also in the, uh, in, during the uh, 90, we have this kind of political liberalization. Do you think that now we are going through a crisis, economic crisis in Algeria? Do you think that our, uh, the Algerian regime will behave in the same uh, way, like the past? And uh, uh, my last question for uh, Dr. Tahir is about the, you know, in the, the presentation, we, we, we have the image of our Algerian army is like, is, uh, is, 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 is a stable, there is no change in it. So we have the same army during the revolution and after the independence and during all the Algerian history. But do, do, uh, do you think that there is a change within the establishment? We have a new generation, educated, and this generation hasn't this, this, uh, this revolutionary uh, legitimacy. Okay. Do you think there is uh, change? And how this change will impact the behavior of the, 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 the military establishment in, uh, his, uh, in its, uh, uh, in its uh, uh, behavior, you know, uh, uh, with the Hirak? Thank you. Okay. Here, Shadi. Uh, please keep because uh, like 30 seconds because uh, I will take more questions. Yes. Direct. Hello, uh, I will keep it short and short. Uh, thank you for this great panel. So it was very informative. Uh, my first question to Professor Yahya regarding the triangle that you speak about uh, presidency, military, and uh, intelligence <laughs> service. The case right now, as I understand it, there is no presidency uh, and the intelligence becomes part of the military. 
So I, I can conclude from this that the most powerful actor right now is the military, and I can expect that he has privilege in shaping the outcome of the Hirak. So do you think that the intelligence still uh, dependent, independent? Uh, okay. To what extent this triangle going to achieve the outcome? The second question for uh, Professor Tahir uh, regarding the survey. Um, for the senior officer's response, uh, uh, I would like to question, do, do you think those representative for the senior officers because they are the, the one who is using internet, going to survey, asking about Iraq, so most likely they are more democratic, more liberal, more educated. So, yeah, to some extent, I think this is, uh, to what extent do you think this is representative of the seniors? The third question is for the panelists, not specific to someone. Uh, if, uh, if we compare between the Sudan and the Algerian Iraq, uh, can we say that the Iraq right now, some of the panelists say this is the, one of the advantages of this Iraq, there is no leadership. So, but in Sudan, there was a leadership that negotiating with the military and reached an agreement. But right now, can we see that the Iraq is indirectly negotiating the army? But in the long run, uh, does this survive? I, I'm, I'm just asking. The last question that will be very short. Uh, if there is any effect in the survey or generally for the, what happening in Egypt for the uh, army, uh, Algerian army response to the protest, can we say that there is any uh, effect from the Egypt? Thank you. Okay, last question there. Yes, please. Yes. Hey, please, 30 seconds. So. Um, question for, a couple of questions for Dr. Tahir Kilabuz. I hope I didn't butcher your name okay. too much. Um, first of all, fantastic study, empirically rigorous, theoretically rich. Um, I wanted to bring your, uh, kind of draw your attention to the classic literature on transitions in which Liberalization is often a trap or a kind of slippery slope for autocrats when they open up regimes. It's not always easy to control the pace of that. And you see this notion of resurrection of civil society, etc., etc. So my question is, is this authoritarian adaptation that you know the Algerian autocrats learned from what happened around the world? Two, have you seen any concrete evidence? I've read some news reports whether the protesters have actually learned from the mistakes that the Egyptian protesters did by you know, kind of focusing just on get, getting rid of Hosni Mubarak rather than changing the regime. Thank you. Uh, any, any question on this side? Yes, please. Um, my question is, uh, considering the intelligence uh, effect on the Algerian political life and considering that there is no leadership uh, how do we expect that the Iraq is going to get any results negotiating uh, a very uh, manipulating system, as Dr. Tahir explained, uh, without having a, a very strict plan on how things are going to be in the future? So, uh, the, considering leadership, non-leadership, uh, as a privilege, is very questionable in this situation. Okay. And thank you. Dr. Luay Safi. My question is about the economic role of the military. I heard some of you mentioning that. Uh, but I'm interested particularly in, in knowing whether there is anything like what happened in Pakistan, the Pakistani army and the Egyptian army trying to to cater for the need of particular segment of the society by providing a sort of colonies or isolated residences with universities and and access to some services that the rest of the population doesn't doesn't have. Okay. Yes. Yes, yes, a short question. Why uh, uh, Aziz Bouteflika was successful in putting an end to the violence in, uh, in Algeria and not al Shazali bin Jadid? Because I, uh, I listened uh, directly to al Shazali bin Jadid much earlier on, 
on his ideas before he submitted his resignation, his ideas on, on uh, uh, accommodating Islamists in the political system of the country. Uh, and he elaborated so much on that. Uh, that is uh, during the early days of the Kuwaiti Iraqi uh, crisis, and we were in Wahran, and he was giving us uh, his thoughts about the the problem in Algeria and his thought and hopes that the Islamists will be accommodated and the problems of, uh, of the violence in the country will be ended much earlier than uh, Bouteflika's later uh, attempts to, to, to put an end to it. Thank you. Uh, yes, okay. I have a short I question for the panel. It's a wonderful uh, panel and I enjoyed it. My name is Ali Abu Zahu, I'm from Libya, so but your neighbor. My question is that the Algerian uh, movement here uh, is not working in a vacuum. In the 90s, France and others interfered with the army, uh, with the generals, to turn the democratic experience. Today, do you think that uh, the army is working on its own, or there is other forces that are interfering uh, to stop the Iraq from being uh, a genuine movement for democracy in Nigeria? Okay, this is the last question because we have like Dr. 12 minutes. <coughs> Dr. Yaya mentioned that there is a deep state in Algeria. Has it run out of options of, of to finding a solution to this crisis, or? Has it become tainted too much that it cannot now allow the state to get out of this situation? So you have a lot of a question now. I uh, give you three to four minutes to Tahir two minutes because uh, your presentation was longer. <laughs> so yes, please. Um, I'll start with the, uh, the last one re regarding the deep state. I have to be honest, I don't know. Why? Because it's so murky right now. Uh, there are different forces at play. Uh, we were having breakfast this morning. What, are, what is the role of the intelligence services? They are out of the picture, you know, the, uh, openly, but they are behind the scenes. You can see, you can decipher or decode some of the media that he talked about, because behind the media there are forces involved in it. So we don't know. But I think the deep, the deep state is the one that let go of Bouteflika. That I, we can uh, say for sure. But what they, how they're going to react to the Iraq, we don't know. Uh, we'll see with, with the, how the movement is progressing. Uh, foreign interference, I start from, from the last one because they're fresher in my mind. Foreign interference, the only ones who are trying to interfere, and the Iraq is very fully aware and has rejected them, are the UAE. These are the, the ones who are the target of the demonstrators because they know, Algerians know very well the street knows, the Hirak knows, that these are the two anti-revolutionary forces, that is the Saudis and the UAE. So it's very clear. They are even showing, mocking Gaid Saleh uh, dressed in a UAE, you know, the Shdesha and all that stuff. So, so people are very much aware. So, and, and the French have been very careful. The neighbors, the immediate neighbors, you know that one guy, former minister in Morocco, has resigned because the king reacted very badly to one of his statements. So, so everybody is aware. The, the Algerians, uh, if you look at all the slogans, which is a study in itself. If I was a doctoral student, this is what I would do. And they are sending clear messages to the United States, to the French. To the French, they say, you know, Macron, deal with your wife. You know, they were making a mockery of that. You know, uh, for, uh, for uh, Trump, they said, we'll sell you olive oil, but don't touch our oil and so on. So, so it's, it's very interesting. So foreign interference, I think foreigners uh, better not try to interfere in, in Algeria's. Um, in fact, they are even accusing, the movement is accusing the, the leaders, the current leaders, of being in cahoots uh, with foreign powers. So, and, and, and I'm sure it's going to create uh, some unease within the armed forces especially the lower ranks that uh, Tahir was talking about, uh, because they are very much, uh, very proud, very nationalistic, and very professional. Um, uh, how the Hirak will get around the leadership? Uh, both he and I agree we don't care about leadership right now, because the regime is very good at co-opting 
uh, any leader that may emerge. So the messages are going straight. It's, it's communication between the street, the Hirak, and the, the current rulers. So it's very clear. Yes, there is a sort of a two radical positions, and uh, we'll see how it will uh, you know, unfold eventually. But um, anyone that appeared, the cleanest people, the reformers, the ones who are pushing for uh, uh, democracy and so on, are staying now, have withdrawn from any, you know, like the Habi and so on. They said, oh, 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 oh. because anybody right now who gets involved on the side of the regime, even to negotiate, is excluded because they see them as being co-opted by the regime. So, so I, I'm not worried about the lack of leadership. The movement knows what it wants. It has kept the Silmiya to, to remain peaceful. And I don't know if someone had, I think someone had asked the question. The, 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 the uh, protest movement has learned from the past experience. This is why they don't go to violence. Violence would have been beneficial. I was myself writing on Facebook, do not, we are, you know, we are many Algerians you know, who are talking on Facebook, do not fall into the trap of going into violence. Because the, the former regime wanted the violence. And I, I'll link this to the question regarding the military. The, the reason why everything collapsed in, in the Bouteflika regime is that the military clearly was not going to shoot at the population. This is very clear. The military made it very clear that it would not intervene against the population. This is what the, the lesson that the military learned from 1988. My, maybe we did not state it, but in 88, the military, which had this great image among the population, this popular army has shot its own children, just like the colonial forces. So it took many years before the military regained this image of a popular force that is on the side uh, of the people. So, so the, the military has learned the lesson, and the high command is fully aware that it cannot trust the lower ranks that because they would not shoot at the people. So the, both the military and the Hirak have learned their lesson. To get back to your question, I think, I'll leave the others to, um, uh, what is your question? I'm sorry, I have it About here. the narrative, about the, the narrative. The narrative, I think, is, is eroded as well. Mm -hmm. it, it, it was right after independence. They had the image of the nationalist movement that was divided. And so the FLN intervened and said, basta, it's only one party. All the other parties are excluded. So if they want, they can join the FLN as individuals, not even as parties. That was very clear. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so the, uh, the, the, it remained for a while. Uh, democracy is not good, and uh, the uh, even the events of uh, 2011 were a conspiracy. I had I interviewed the prime minister of Algeria when he was in office. And he was telling me, you know, all this movement, you know, is from, you know, that, that, that's basic. But it doesn't work anymore because it's coming genuinely from the, uh, from the Hirak, from the population. Uh, somebody asked me about the structure. Right now, it's, it's murky. You, you don't know. Uh, yes, it seems that the high command is in power. But what is happening with the deep state, uh, with the intelligence services? They, believe me, they are not in the picture, but they have not disappeared. So, but again, I have to be honest with you, we don't have. One of the, uh, one of the aspects, the more, uh, f I mean, everybody is aware of that, any specialist of Algeria, the, the, the system is very opaque. You don't know what really goes on within the system, uh, let alone within the deep state. But I think the deep state will eventually have to make concessions and agree to a transition, whatever it is. When I was writing in the, in the 90s on Algeria, the failure of the transition in the 90s was the lack of a, a, a negotiated pact uh, at that time. The, 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 the regime could have had it, but I think without, and again, I'm open to criticism, I think the FIS screwed up the whole, uh, uh, the whole process because it came, the FIS came with no negotiation it wanted regime change and opposed even the other forces. 
and, and the, the, the Muslim Brotherhood was in a tough situation. I, I, I was friends with, uh, with Mahfoud Ma'na, Allah uh, You know, he was telling me, they're killing even my own people. They're killing the, the Muslim Brotherhood, you know? So, so whatever hope there was for a, a negotiated transition did not happen. So that, that is my answer to you. Um, I think I should let the okay. others uh, Thank have you very their much. Thank you very much. I like it very much your uh, the questions, you know. To save my time, you know, I, I am not going to repeat what my friend said, you know. Uh, uh, okay. I said, you know, Zubir has already responded to some questions, you know. So to save some time, I will focus on some questions. The first one, it, it is a really a running question. It was uh, asked yesterday by the president of one panel and also uh, the actual president, you know, said, you know, what are the step, the practical step that we have to, to do further? I think this question is, is a theoretical question. We cannot build same strategy with you if we don't have the same understanding of the situation. We cannot build the same strategy if your project is different from mine. For, for instance, I, I like to, to build, you know, uh, Islamic you know, state. And uh, you have, you know, secular state. We have nothing in common, I am sorry. Because our understanding, our situation are different. So uh, I think we should understand really in objective way and scientific way, the whole issue. What is the background and how the civil military and power relationship uh, have been uh, developed in our countries. And, and here we have, we have to come back to the deep state. What is the relationship between democratization, civil society and deep state? Why democratization has failed over 30 years? Why? What is deep connections? And what is the relationship with deep state and foreign, and, and foreign players? But, but too bad the people, in our scholars, do not raise these questions. Because scholarship is based on the law journalism. That is a question. The, the teaching, uh, uh, and uh, has been very, very, uh, uh, very long. The first crisis about the education. Myself, you know, uh, when I see, you know, professors of uh, big universities, you know, and, uh, repeat what, what, uh, what journalists, you know, have said on very, very complicated and complex issue, I think it, it, it is really terrible. We should, first of all, and I hope this center, uh, we should, uh, uh, we develop a you know, kind of theoretical you know, uh, um, project to, to bring uh, graduate students you know, to develop this issue. It is really theoretical. And, be, uh, and we have to understand, to understand outside, we have to build our own theory. We shouldn't wait from New York or whatever you know, to bring in a theory to explain what is going on. These people, they come here in big hotel, they stay a few days, and then, and then they write books, you know, then they said their recommendation to our you know, home rulers, and they, they take you know, strong decisions. I think uh, we, we have to tackle this crucial issue. The second, qu second uh, question is you know, about the, the economic crisis craze that we are facing now. Is some relationship with, uh, uh, with, with the past has, has for the political situation? I think uh, we are living two different situations, two different you know, historical contexts. We cannot have the, the, same, the same tools. It, it, it's quite different, you know, from population, from, you know, on constraint, from the globalization, and so on. We have to understand the situation is evolving quickly, quickly. And we, in the third world, in Muslim side, we stay stick in the old-fashioned, in the old concepts. We have to do our own, you know, theoretical uh, revolution, you know, I think we have to do it. Otherwise, you know, we cannot understand, we cannot be decision makers in our own destiny. I think we have to be very um, cautious about that. Another question about the uh, comparison between the Sudan and the Algerian Iraq. I think that there is a very important uh, difference. The Sudan 
has relatively speaking strong civil society. Algeria doesn't have this civil society. The Sudan has ha ha struggled all, all over the past uh, 10 years, 20 years to build this kind of society. And this, it is background of the old elite. The old elite in the Sudan, the 70s and 80s, they went to, uh, to jails and, and they have, you know, um, Marxist and very scientific you know, background, you know, and they taught to, to the young generation how to build in civil society. And the civil society, you know, in, uh, in Sudan, in comparison to Algeria, is relatively, you know, stronger. And it has, you know, on, on, on leadership, they, they were able to discuss you know, kind and uh, transition with uh, the military establishment. But the Pika destroyed civil society in Algeria. Yeah. Yeah, about the, 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 the Iraq, the background. The, 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 the Iraq, you know, it is the, the result of the long, of the long process of struggles. In Algeria, we have strike, you know, over 30 years, you know. From in 2010, according to the official, you know, uh, statistics, you know, we had, you know, 10,000 uh, strikes, one year. I think in every corner in Algeria, we, we have strike, we have violence, we have, you know, um, uh, the disturb, you know, the issue. So the Iraq, it, it is a consecration of, of long, of long process. And then every, and that is what is going on in the Arab world. And Iraq, that's my strong theoretical argument, you know, which is the second wave of the Arab Spring. That is, uh, the, that is the, crucial, uh, the crucial issue, and, and Iraq learned from, 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 from the, past, uh, the past experience now. I think we have in Sudan, we have in, 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 in Minicosia, even though in Africa we have to, uh, to take close look to Africa. What is going on? A lot of things, you know. We shouldn't uh, concentrate you know, to, uh, uh, to, build, uh, uh, to build up our bases on, uh, on, on Arab world and the Muslim, Muslim world. We have, uh, to, to, we have you know, um, a strategic uh, you know, dimension on, on Africa from history, from culture, from our struggle and so on. Oh, thank, thank you, you very much. Uh, last words. Okay, um, I'm going to try to cover very quickly. Um, first, let me tell you something, about, some, some stuff about the survey and it can be an answer for Ustad Ahmed's question, question as well. So um, today, if we try to work with an Algerian survey agency and let their enumerators to go to the street and ask these questions, probably they're gonna get arrested. So it was not possible to do that on the street. That's why we tried an online survey, which has certain downturns, because you cannot have a real representative online survey. Uh, you have to give up on something. So we could ask more sensitive questions and we could reach out to Algerians, but it is not entirely representative. Uh, we used Facebook advertisement to target people. It's not like the classical Facebook yes and no survey. Like it's, it's just, we just use advertisement to uh, direct people to our survey. And uh, we did some checks. Luckily, we don't have any bots, but there are some concerns about it. What we tried is to get certain representativeness in terms of age, gender, and education, and we more or less got that. But we cannot have an ideological distribution, those kind of stuff. When it comes to military officers, we depend on their own like, self-reporting. So we ask whether they are belonging to military, and we are asking their ranks. So when they say senior officers, we think they are senior officers, we cannot prove it. Uh, so we cannot know how representative it is. But, I mean, probably all senior officers use some sort of internet. So we hope it is to some extent representative, but we cannot know how much. And in relation to that, Dr. Harris, um, Yanni, um, clearly there is a change in the establishment of the army throughout time. Uh, the, the thing that did not necessarily change is that army does not want to leave power. Of course, the personnel is changing, the people are changing, and, and the different groups are changing. Like even in 19, early, early 1990s, late 1980s, there was a gap between the senior officers and junior officers. Junior officers want to change more than the senior officers. And we are seeing the same thing today as well, as, as, as Dr. Yahya explained. Um, about Dr. Akil's question about liberalization being a, a slippery slope. So, yes, I mean, like liberalization led to democratization, especially in Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa. 
Um, so it is correct that um, in, in certain places, liberalization was the first step for democratization. But actually, in another research that I had, I tested this uh, across different uh, regions. And we see that this argument about liberalization leading to democratization is working during the third wave, and especially in Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa, not necessarily in other regions. And specifically in the Middle East, the uh, direction of the effect is on the opposite direction. In the Middle East, liberalization leads to the survival of authoritarian regimes more than any other region. So it is a slippery slope, but somehow it worked. And probably they are learning from other authoritarians as well. Um, I don't know necessarily in 1990s that they learned from others, but uh, there is a literature about authoritarian learning as well, which I'm sure you know, uh, that like, authoritarian leaders are copycatting from each other as well. So that's, that's happening too. Whether protesters learned from the others, um, so I cannot prove because we don't have a direct question about it, but as Dr. Yahya said, we can use certain things because we asked um, <coughs> their expectations about the protest and asked like whether they end up as Tunisia or Egypt, but well, Algerians like to be the Algerians, so they said, no, we are going to be Algerian, we are going to be different, not going to be like that. And we also asked, um, how the protest should pursue, like protesters pursue as a strategy, whether they want more violent strategies or non-violent strategies. And we asked this question about a month ago, so later in the protest moment, and we gave different strategies and asked them to rank from one to four. So these are the results. Uh, for continuation of protest, peaceful protest, it is 2.9 out of four. For sit-in and strikes, it is about 1.5. For civil disobedience, uh, I see in Medani, I'm still not sure what exactly it is because, because it's a vague term, but it is about one. And now coming to the violent strategies, right, um, private, uh, some, um, some um, taking over some private properties and government buildings or attacking security forces is 0 0.1 out of four. So, that probably shows that they, they learn from other experiences and try to keep it on the uh, peaceful side. So, um, okay. yeah, let me leave it here because okay. Dr. Fahd is... So, uh, if you still have a question, our guests are uh, at our campus today and tomorrow. Uh, thank you for Dr. Uh, Yahya Zubair. Thank you for Rashid Telmisani and Tahir Kelavos. Uh, this was a very... Um, clear presentations and we have a lot of idea about uh, the relationship between military etc in uh, in Algeria by this I conclude and give uh, Dr. Abdul Rahman Maqdad the word. Okay. Uh, first I'd like to uh, welcome our rector Dr. Mohamed Baluk thank you very much for joining us. Uh, he was uh, supposed to be with us yesterday but I told you that he couldn't for uh, personal and family reasons but we're happy that he is with us today. Abdul Rahman uh, right, thank you very much for our panelists. Uh, we'd like to hand out the certificates. Dr. Sami, please. Um, Dr. Yahya. <laughs> Dr. Rashid. Rashid, Afwan, Dr. Rashid. Dr. Tahir. And finally, our own Fadi Zatari. Thank you very much, everybody. We will break for lunch. Um, okay, so we will break until 3, and we will be back.